Hey guys, welcome to episode two of Terra Talks, the show where I give you the latest gaming news, as well as a great strategical tip that you can use in my favorite game, StarCraft II. This week, we'll be talking about Capcom's unfortunate decision to stop making reboots of any of their fighting games, as well as the new StarCraft Heart of the Swarm units and changes. In addition, we'll also be adding a cool new segment called Terra's Topic. This is a topic that I got to choose and I get to delve a little bit deeper into and give you guys my opinions. Before I jump into the news, I want to address some of the suggestions you guys left down in the comments last week. Firstly, I hope you guys immediately noticed the change in sound. As soon as I heard the finalized product of last week's show, I jumped right online and bought a new $150 Rode microphone just to make sure the production quality is up to par with the rest of the video. Hopefully you guys um, appreciate that change because I definitely don't want to sound like I'm echoey and in a bathroom anymore. In addition, I would like to attack the notion that I'm not actually a gamer and that I was just hired for my looks or my modeling career. In reality, I write for two different gaming websites, stream StarCraft 2 on my Twitch TV channel three to four times a week, as well as doing retro nights of games that I grew up with on Sundays. I also have over a hundred gameplay VODs on YouTube, and you can check those out as well. So, legitimate gamer I am. Lastly, I'll be working diligently on my speech. Public speaking and speaking in front of a video camera is probably the hardest thing for me to do, and I'm trying to get more used to it. In fact, that's one of the main reasons why I started streaming on Twitch TV. Gameplay plus trying to get better at speech. So hopefully each episode will bring a little bit better quality to my speaking. But as you can see, when I'm not going off of a really strict guideline, I start rambling and sounding pretty awkward. Sorry about that, guys. I'll work on it. All right, let's jump into the news section. Topic one is gonna be about the Xbox 3 or 720 or whatever you heard it called and the new rumors surrounding the console. Let's check those out. One issue circulating is that the Xbox 3 is going to be always online, meaning you need a permanent internet connection to even play the console. This is really controversial with people who say that their internet connection goes down all the time and they really want some offline gameplay. I kind of agree. One cool bit of information surfacing regarding the Xbox 3 is that it's going to be using the Jaguar 86 AMD processor, which is the same processor going to be used in PlayStation 4 as well as modern PCs. This will make ports much, much easier to make. This new partnership with AMD means that Microsoft will be dropping their connection with IBM's PowerPC, and the Xbox 3 won't be backwards compatible with Xbox 360 discs. I love my backwards compatibility, and I hope that they make some kind of mod or chip for it in the future. Latest news suggests that this no disc stuff is total bullshit, and that Xbox 3 will run on Blu-ray discs as well as downloadable content and services. We've been hearing a lot lately that Microsoft might not actually wait until E3 to reveal the next Xbox. May 21st is a date that I'm hearing a lot about, and I'm really, really, really looking forward to seeing some actual facts on this topic. Right now, we're worried about what's killing our Marines in there. This is a liquid situation. Aliens Colonial Marines will no longer be released for the Wii U. Publisher Sega didn't give a clear reason, but the Metacritic for all the other platforms was pretty poor, including PC, Xbox, and PS3. This might be a great indicator as to why they're no longer releasing it on this platform. Randy Pitchford of Gearbox Studios always claimed the Wii U version to be the best, and this is probably because you could use the gamepad as an actual scanner for the Xenomorphs. It's quite sad we're not going to see this version come to fruition. So in summation, Aliens Colonial Marines sucked and it's very disappointing. Is there anyone else here who learned about facehuggers from the Animaniacs SNES game and not actual aliens first? Or am I just weird? After making games like Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix, Marvel vs. Capcom Origins, and Darkstalkers Resurrection, Capcom has decided to stop making HD remakes of its fighting games. Apparently, sales of their last two releases took a dive compared to earlier titles, leading Capcom to believe that the market for their HD fighting games remakes to be saturated. Rest assured though, that Capcom will still be making HD remakes, just not of its fighting games. They do have DuckTales in the works, which is awesome, right? Huey, Dewey, and Louie and Scrooge are amazing, but I would like someone to make me a Darkwing Duck game. Is that possible? Will anyone do that for me? For this week's Terra Topic, I'd like to talk about Blizzard's World Championship Series changes for 2013, as it is kind of a controversial and confusing topic at the moment. Last year, there was a region lock for North America, Europe, and Korea. This year, players can personally declare their own region, and it won't be based on their residency or nationality. However, each player will have to stick with the region that they chose for a full year. 
Blizzard also chose the highest profile tournament organizations in Korea, NA, and EU to hold this year's tournament events. OGN slash GSL, MLG, and ESL respectively. For instance, GSL Code S will now be 2013 WCS Korea GSL Code S. It's a little confusing. These overall changes are meant to revitalize foreign competition, as well as ensure foreigners win more tournaments. But in fact, over 20 Koreans have chosen NA or EU as their region, leaving us all wondering whether or not there's going to be just more Korean domination in the scene. There is a point system as well. Points can be accrued from big tournaments outside of WCS, all of which will factor into who goes to the finals at BlizzCon this November. Right before my birthday. I'll be there, will you? I personally think there should be more large-scale semi-pro and region lock tournaments to encourage new players and foreign players to reach for the stars, as well as to help back them in getting some new tournament earnings that they can use to put toward their goals. I love the idea of having MKP running around looking adorable and the Muslim walking around with his glorious British accent in the same place, but I do understand that it can be off-putting for foreigners to continually get stomped by top Koreans every tournament. I'm worried that this will also deter foreigners from trying out for the GSL, an endeavor I always enjoyed watching. What do you guys think on this matter? Let me know in the comments. This brings up an interesting point to me. Is it really a good idea to have the game's developers running a lot of the larger tournaments? Do you think there are any negative side effects to this? Related to this is the fact that Blizzard recently bought the IPL team, but don't get excited. They say that they're going to use these people for more online endeavors rather than actually running the tournament. This really makes me sad as this is a loss of another great NA tournament and IPL was also in Las Vegas, so it was a great time. IPL was just announcing that they were going to do quarterly tournaments rather than yearly and everything was looking pretty bright. I'm wondering where it went wrong exactly. Alright, this concludes the news section as well as the new Terrace Topic segment for the week. Let me go jump into something more wartime appropriate and then we'll talk about the new StarCraft 2 tutorial. See you in a second! Okay, now that I'm supporting our hard-working SCVs with my new shirt, Let's start talking about the new Heart of the Swarm changes and units for the Terran. The 250mm cannon has been removed from the Thor. The Thor can now switch between two different modes, the default mode being Explosive Payload, the same Mutalist Destroyer we saw before HOTS with extra splash and some extra damage versus light. Switching to High Impact Payload will increase air damage to a flat 24, devoid of splash. This is great for non-clumped air units or harder to kill single target units such as the Broodlord or Tempest. They also look really, really badass in this mode, especially if you have the Collector's Edition skin from Wings of Liberty. An added bonus to the removal of the 250mm cannon ability on the Thor is the fact that it's not going to need energy anymore and will be impervious to Protoss' feedback. This makes it more viable against Protoss. I'm actually thinking about, in my own personal play, using Thors as like a mech option maybe for High Templars and Storms. Probably my favorite Terran Hots change is the new Ignite Afterburner's ability for the Metavax. This allows for a speed increase for 8 seconds with a cooldown of 20 seconds. This is really powerful in conjunction with the new Hellbat units we'll be talking about in a little bit, as well as any other drop harass units in any stage of the game. Something that really got me into playing Terran when I first started out was Select's amazing drop harass, multi-pronged everywhere, things were going crazy, and I really loved that, and that's what really solidified me as Terra the Terran. Factory and Starport armor upgrades have been consolidated into one upgrade now in the armory. No more excuses not upgrading your bio-supporting Viking and tank armor. Our tanks come off the assembly line fully ready to siege now. Forget the days of needing to get an ability from the tech lab. Our ledges will be reinforced sooner, but watch out for earlier contain attacks from our Terran enemies in the Dominion. Reapers no longer require a tech lab. This means that they will be produced much earlier in game and at higher quantities. To balance this fact, they will no longer do extra damage to light or buildings, but they will heal out of combat due to their new... combat drugs. Now that we've gotten the general changes out of the way, let's move on to the two new unit advancements Swan has cooked up for us over on the Hyperion. If you ask me, this new Terran unit is a bit overpowered. Oh yes! Oh, did you see that? Oh my god! The Widowmine can burrow in three seconds time and send out a huge blast dealing 125 damage and 40 splash to anything in the vicinity. Fortunately, the mines do have to reactivate for 40 seconds before they can go off again. When burrowed, they are invisible, so detection will be needed to see them and eliminate them. One important thing to note about the Widow Mine is that it deals spell damage. What this means is that abilities like the Viper's Blinding Cloud won't actually have any effect on them. The Widow Mine was initially designed to give our mech openings a little bit more oomph, but with its explosive potential, it does seem to be a little bit too much. What do you guys think? <laughs> Get it? Explosive potential? Oh, 
by the way, you can also upgrade their burrow speed so that they're underground and operational instantly. For those of you who loved the Hellion for early game harass, but felt that it wasn't as vital of a unit when stepping into late game, this new unit is for you. The Helldat requires an armory to directly produce and just a factory tech lab in order to use the Hellion transformation. The Helldat is a great late game choice in a mech army and has the added benefit of being able to be healed by a medevac or repaired by an SCV, as in this state it's considered a bio and mechanical unit. Pretty cool, huh? When transforming to the Hellbat stage, the unit loses its long range, but gains a stronger conical AoE attack, as well as extra damage versus light and increased armor. I especially love this unit as it acts as a tribute to my favorite StarCraft 1 unit, the Firebat. It's funny how both of the Terran units are just reboots of old Brood War units, the Widowmine being a mirror of the Spider Mine, of course. Well, there you have it. This concludes this week's Terra Talks, episode number two. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and let me know down in the comments what you think. Did I do a better job this week? Are you more informed on StarCraft and gaming news? Let me know. See you guys next week.